Um, but going back, we, we uh, celebrated, and I say celebrated, 18 years after the 9-11 uh, tragedy because we're still celebrating lives, uh, those folks that were lost. Um, but for me, September 11th has a whole different meaning. It happens to be my anniversary date. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, celebrating an anniversary on the day of the tragedy was, was really difficult. I remember um, going to the Altamont Mall around noontime to get my wife a present, and they were shutting everything down. And as they were pulling down the, uh, the gate, I told the girl, please, please, you got to let me get something. And she allowed me to go in and purchase something for my wife. But then we went out later on that night, and I think we were the only, us and another couple in the restaurant, it just felt weird. We said, you know what, uh, we're not going to do this, we're just going to go home. <laughs> But um, it's kind of put a damper on our anniversary date ever since then. But nothing, uh, nothing that can be compared to the loss of life and the people that are still grieving because of that tragedy today. Uh, and, you know, the neat thing about this is that uh, never forgetting helps us to stay alert and to cherish those people who have um, lost their lives as a result of that. Um, we as human beings, we need that time to grieve, but grief is just a part of loving people, isn't it? When we grieve, it's because we care. When we grieve, it's because we've lost a little bit of ourselves, but yet that person still remains within us, amen? And, um, you know, the relationships that we develop over the years are very important because it's the same way God wants to develop a relationship with you that's ongoing. In fact, Christ says, when you cry, I cry. When you hurt, I hurt. In other words, he's associating the pains and the griefs that we feel with what he understands as God and as a human being. He knows exactly what we're going through, and he wants us to be able to um, know that he is with us, that you're not alone, that he shares in that pain and suffering that we go through. And in the book of Ephesians, I'm going to go ahead and just start a little series of reading through the book of Ephesians. We um, have the Apostle Paul who also gives us an understanding of the relationship between God the Father and Christ and with his people or his church. And he regards um, his church many times throughout the book of Ephesians as his bride. I've uh, officiated in many weddings and uh, one of the ones that struck me the most is when I was standing next to the bridegroom. You know, a wedding is a, is a spectacular thing because there's so much planning that goes into that, doesn't it? Um, and of course, everybody's dressed up, everybody looks beautiful, and then here comes uh, the bride. And the father has the privilege of walking down the bride down that aisle for the last time as his daughter. Now, I felt that once before he gives away his daughter to some guy. Well, hopefully the guy's a good guy, right? But you know what was interesting was when this one wedding that I was officiating, um, the bridegroom, uh, strong guy, muscular guy, um, one of those guys that, you know, he just looked like a manly man, a macho man. But as soon as he saw his bride coming down the aisle, he just started weeping as though somebody just turned on the faucets and the tears were just coming down. And um, he was just so, I guess, emotionally caught up in the moment because he realized he was leaving this, his beautiful mama for this beautiful girl. <laughs> but it was just kind of funny to see this strong guy weeping like a little child. And in that weeping was tears of joy and tears of responsibility and tears of hope and tears of sadness and tears of spending my life with you for eternity. And you know, in our relationship with God, it's the same thing. We are his bride and he is the bridegroom. And when Jesus sees you, it brings tears of joy. Amen? And God continues to uh, struggle with us because we all know that a marriage takes a lot of work. You know, you don't get married and you live happily ever after. You get married and guess what? There's bills to pay. There's uh, things that you got to discuss. Are we going to your mom's this year for Thanksgiving or what? <laughs> you know, there's uh, negotiations that have to be made and uh, concessions. Um, there's a lot that goes into marriage. You just don't get married and stay married. You have to continue to work at marriage. Uh, 
by the way, we've, my wife and I have been married 36 years, and when um, her coworkers asked her this week, how long have you been married, they couldn't believe, because they thought my wife was a lot younger than what she was, but she said, well, what, how old were you got married, 12? I said, no, that's when we met. <laughs> but uh, we've actually been together a little over 40 years. Um, so it's, you think about it, and it's like, wow, I'm getting old, or... <laughs> We've spent a lifetime together since we were children. And it still keeps going forward because you know what? Uh, somebody told me, well, congratulations, Richard. I said, don't congratulate me. Congratulate her. She's had to put up with me all these years, you know? And uh, she's the woman that God had for me because he knew I needed a woman that was strong, a woman that, uh, that needed to tell me where I needed to be, you know? Um, and I always tell my wife, you know, God knew exactly what he was doing when he brought us together because uh, even though I didn't know what a Puerto Rican was when I first met you, he sure did. And uh, he made sure that, um, that he was going to keep me straight with this woman. So, you know, a marriage, there's a lot of ups and downs and we celebrate things together and sometimes we get upset at each other. But we keep working at that marriage to keep it strong. We keep working at that marriage to keep it moving in the direction. You don't wake up every morning and say, oh, what a wonderful marriage. No, you got to make it happen. And when your wife, her hair is here and there and she doesn't have any makeup, you still tell her she's beautiful. Why? Because she is. Because you're looking deeper than the outward appearance. You're looking straight into the heart. And uh, believe me, guys, if you tell your wife she's beautiful every morning, you're going to have breakfast every morning as well. It's just a two-way street. Well, let's get into the first part of the first chapter of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul is writing to us. Um, he wrote a good book, or many books, but I, I like the book of Ephesians because it talks about our spiritual walk with God and how we can receive blessings through Christ. It also gives us uh, the understanding that every believer has special gifts and talents and possibilities through the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, that our spiritual strength comes from God through his word as we build our personal faith in him. Now, it's not building our faith in the church or in people, but it's in Christ Jesus and in his word that we put our faith in. Amen? So let us pray and let us get into this um, as we begin. Father in heaven, bless your word today as we open it up and fill us with your joy. Help us to have the understanding from above and to implement your word into our daily lives as we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Ephesus was a city with a lot of distractions or a lot of things happening, a lot of people worshiping different types of gods. But Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus so that the Christians would know what God also thought of his people. You see, uh, some people often ask me a question and says, well, what is your granddaughter like? And I said, man, she's the best thing in the whole world. And I can imagine Jesus saying that about you. What is inspired church like? She's the apple of my eye. Well, she's kind of small. That doesn't matter. You see, because I care about the smallest things in life. The best thing about Inspire Church are the people who attend, the people that worship, the music that we listen, the praise that I receive. God cherishes you and he cherishes us as a whole. Why? Because you are what? You are love with an everlasting love and you are precious in his sight. Last night I had to drive to my son's house after work because I hadn't seen my granddaughter in about five days and it was just tearing me apart. <laughs> and uh, it's she's... A little trip, she's about this high, and when she sees me, it's, hey, I think she's Italian, hey, she puts her hands up and reaches out for me. It's, it's a wonderful feeling, folks. When was the last time you told Jesus, hey, thanks for being in my life? We got to reach out to him, folks, because he's reaching out to us constantly. We all desire to have relationships in which we are accepted, valued, and wanted, Agreed? There's nothing worse than not to be accepted. Uh, when I was a kid, I went to elementary school, and the school was mostly Anglo-American or white. Uh, there was only a few of us little Chicanos out there, maybe one black in the whole school. And I remember coming to the lunchroom with my little brown sack of food, and 
I put it down. Everybody was coming with their plates of food from the cafeteria or with their little lunch pails. Remember those? And they would open their little lunch pails and take out their sandwiches and open up their thermos and pour their little juice or milk into the thermos. And I didn't have any of that. I opened up my brown bag and uh, wrapped up in some tin foil was a, a really nice burrito. <laughs> And it was still hot from the morning. And, uh, it, you know, you can smell the beans and the cheese. And it just smelled great. I mean, that's, that was my life. Rice, uh, I mean, beans and tortillas. But I remember opening it up really slow because everybody was looking at me. Like, oh, who is this kid? He's weird. Why does he have a brown sack? And what's in that tinfoil? And I remember, like, Opening it up like this. I was hungry. You know, I wanted to eat. And this was made with love. I mean, my mother got together in the morning and put those beans and the tortillas and rolled them up. And I remember just taking a little bit because I didn't want the people to see what I was eating because I wasn't eating a sandwich. So I went home that day and I said, Mommy, Mommy, what, son, what? You got to buy me a lunch pail. A what? A lunch pail. A pail for what? For lunch. And I explained to her, you know, that, that tin thing that has a, a picture of, of you know, uh, like Scooby-Doo or somebody on the front. She wasn't sure what I was talking about. And we went to the boys' market, and there was some lunch pails. And she looked at the price and said, I'm not going to spend that money for that. There's four of you. you got to be crazy. I said, well, buy one, and we'll share. <laughs> you know? But it was just all about trying to fit in. I didn't want to be looked at differently than all the other kids. And uh, at first she didn't buy me the lunch pail. She said, well, you got to wait till I get paid, right? That was a, her famous word. You got to wait till I get paid. Um, but yet I remember saying, mommy, don't make me any more burritos. Just put a bologna sandwich in there. <laughs> so I could at least pull out the sandwich and not be made fun of. It's very important for a young child to be accepted. And much like adults, you know, when you get into the business world, you want to fit in. You want to look like everybody, sound like everybody, laugh at the, the boss's jokes that aren't funny, right? Um, I first got into an a architecture firm, a multidisciplinary firm, uh, that there were planners and architects and landscape architects and different types of folks working in there. And everybody's dressed up in ties, and I felt important, so I went and I bought me a tie. And um, then they were standing around one morning listening to the boss, and he was cracking these jokes, and everybody was, oh, <laughs> and I'm standing there, and I'm like, I don't get it. What was funny about what he said? And everybody's looking at me like, why aren't you laughing, Rich? And I'm like, because it wasn't funny. But he's the boss. And I'm like, and? Needless to say, I didn't last there too long. But we all somehow want to fit in, especially when you're growing up as a teenager. You know, your nose is bigger than the rest of your body, and everybody is trying to look cool and do the things that everybody's doing because they don't want to be thought of as different. And you give into something that's called peer pressure, don't you? But you know, there's peer pressures at all levels, aren't there? Uh, but God wants us to understand one thing. You are who you are because I made you that way. You are perfect just the way I made you. Amen? You know, today, one of the fads is, uh, once again, everybody's trying to get skinny again. I, I, I gave up. I said, man, I, I like this cushion. My, daughter, my granddaughter loves it. She jumps. She, she plays with it. She bounces on it. It's, it's a neat thing. You know, I think that's the way we're supposed to be as grandparents, right? <laughs> but God wants us to understand that we truly are valued. And you know how much he valued you to Jesus this much? On the cross. And that's what Paul wanted us to know. He says this in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, first of all, he has to reinstate who he is because a lot of the other folks didn't really regarded him as a disciple of Christ. But he says, I am an apostle because that is what God wanted. Amen? And if God wants something for you, there's nobody that can change that. Did you hear me? If God wants you to be somebody big or somebody that he can use, there's nothing that anybody else can do to change that. 
I sat in front of a, a bunch of chaplains the other day. There was about 12 of them that came to visit my facility. And I sat them down to talk to them about the facility. And I says, let me tell you something about myself, guys. I says, I don't have the credentials you have. And they all looked at me. I says, yeah, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I don't have a master's degree of divinity. I don't have all the clinical pastoral education units that you guys have. And that's what you need in order to be employed as a chaplain. And they're looking at me and they says, so how did you get employed? And I says, oh, because somebody just liked me, I guess. But here's what I found out. If God wants you to be a chaplain, he's going to hire you to be a chaplain. ¿Y qué? And what are you going to do about it? You can't go against God, can you? <laughs> Many times the people will look at me and they'll say, well, Richard, how did you get this job? I says, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. I just know that there's a God in heaven who loves me and gave himself for me. Amen? And he's using me for his honor and glory, even though sometimes I have to work at it. So Paul says, I'm an apostle because that's what God wanted. And to God's holy people living in Ephesus, the believers in Christ Jesus, he once again gives a salutation of grace and peace be unto you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ so that you are clear who this blessing comes from. It doesn't come from the church. It doesn't come from the pope. It doesn't come from the president. It comes directly from the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ and our Lord. Amen? And then he goes on to say, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is in Christ God that he has given us every spiritual blessing in this heavenly world. Now many of us look at what we don't have and say, this is why we can't accomplish it. But you know, if God be with us, we can accomplish much more than we could ever think or believe, can't we? You know, God started off with 12 people on this earth. He didn't start off with a congregation of 15,000. And Christianity has grown and grown and grown over the years. And he's used so many people to do great things all over the world. There was a man, I was uh, talking to a, a pastor friend of mine who's an evangelist, and he went into Peru to do some meetings. And um, this one individual who we call him a, a campesino, in other words, he, he was a farm worker. He, uh, his whole livelihood was working on the farm. But every morning at four in the morning, he'd get up, not to tend to his flock, but to go into the deeper jungle of Peru to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. He went into the high plains, the altiplanos up there in Peru, um, near the mountains to speak to the people about Jesus Christ. And this man would carry a Bible, but he could not read. And so you say, how did he get the gospel to these folks? Well, he memorized everything the pastor would say the week before and take that same message to the folks out in the fields. And when it was time to have this big evangelistic meeting, he came with all the folks that he had been speaking with, and they came from miles all around. And he went to the pastor, and he started crying. He says, Pastor, I'm so sorry I failed. And the pastor says, what did you fail? You brought 130 people here to be baptized. He says, no, but I told the Lord I was going to have 150. 130 people. If, if somebody brought 130 people uh, to be baptized here, he'd be all over the news, wouldn't he? He'd be on Facebook, and he'd be everywhere. And, and this, this man who was working so hard for the gospel of the kingdom of heaven was so upset because he didn't reach 150. He only had 130. He keeps working for the Lord today. It doesn't matter if God wants you to be that disciple of his and to bring people to the Lord, he's going to use you, even if you cannot read. Because why? Because God has given us every spiritual blessing in this world. What Christ has done is that he chose us before this world was made so that we would be his people, his holy people, his representatives here on earth. And guess what? You're it. He has chosen you. Have you chosen him? Let me tell you something. It feels good to be chosen. But sometimes when people choose you, you're like, well, well, well I'm not sure yet, man. Let me think about this for a minute. Let me, I love when people say, well, let me pray about this. If God is calling you, just go. When, they call, when Denise called me and said we were looking uh, as, to you as a prospect, I'm like, man, I don't want to do this. 
I'll be honest. I said, but you know what, Lord? She wouldn't have called me if you wouldn't have put my, my face in her mind. So guess what? I'm going. And I went through the process. And as a result, almost a year later, here we are. But you know what, folks? This, is, this continually happens. Uh, God will send you places where you don't want to go. God will send you places and, and, and be involved in things that he can use you for his purpose, his honor, his glory. And we may not understand. We may, well, I don't have the tools or I don't have the understanding. Or maybe, I, maybe there's somebody better. There's always somebody better than you for the position. But you know what? He's calling you right now. And if you follow him, if you listen to his ways, good things are going to come out of it. Amen? And you know what the best thing about being a leader of Inspire is not what I bring to the table, but what you guys have brought to me. And that's the joy of seeing you guys every week and seeing how this place functions. I'm still learning. So Jesus wants us to know that we are his representatives. But here's the catch in verse 3. It says, we must be people without blame before him. I got to sit down now. I'm sorry. I can't go any further. Because I'm a sinner. How can God use a sinner? You ever think about that? Well, wait a minute, Lord. You know, when I get fixed with my life, then I'll come to serve you. It's too late. God can't use you with that attitude. We got to be humble servants of God coming as we are knowing that we are imperfect in serving a perfect God. So many people feel that they cannot come to church because they just aren't right with God. You know what? That's the biggest lie ever. That's the biggest lie ever. I had a friend named Frank. He was a drug dealer in New York City. His girlfriend invited him to come to church one day. He says, no, man, I got a deal. God doesn't come to my house, and I don't go to his house. We were on two different paths, two different roads. You know, it was kind of neat. Frank even at that time understood that. And Frank was the type of drug dealer. He says, man, if you were pregnant and you owe me money, I'd push you down, kick you in the stomach, and take your purse. That's the type of individual he was. But it happened to be that day about 17 degrees outside, and it started to snow. And so as he was waiting for his girlfriend inside the church, he got too cold. Now, I've been in New York when it's about 36 degrees, and let me tell you something, it's a different 36 degrees than what happens here. It will cut through your bones. <laughs> I remember uh, I, my wife and I got uh, to New York City, and it was about 38 degrees, and I had to go and buy some extra socks. It was so cold. Um, well, as he was waiting in the cold and it started to snow, he says, oh, man, this is for the birds. Let me just go inside and at least get some warmth and so he went into the church lobby and it was still kind of cold in the church lobby but inside the church sanctuary is a little bit warmer so a little little 10 minutes later he made his way inside the church and he said let me just sit here at this last pew and get warmed up and as he was sitting there with his mind on other things. See, he was thinking about where he had to go and make a delivery and who he was going to have to sell to next and where he was going to get his next, next pickup and he'd have to go meet with his manager to hand over some cash. He said all of a sudden he started to hear the message being preached and something happened that day. The word of God penetrated his heart, penetrated his mind because Frank was still part of that bride and he was about to meet the bridegroom and when the preacher started preaching about giving your life to Christ it convicted it didn't condemn Frank of what he was doing it convicted him of the hopes that God has for him in the future and Frank left everything he had to do with the drug business on that pew and came up to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior amen And Frank's been working for the Lord for the past 25 years. And I had the privilege of ministering with him for at least five years in the juvenile detention centers. And he's still on fire for Jesus, making bounds wherever he goes, bringing people the gospel message to Christ. It's amazing what God can do when you're not perfect and when you're not ready to do what God wants you to do. And so God calls us, but he says he wants us to be blameless before him. 
Because of his love, God has already decided to make us his own children through Christ Jesus. And that's what he wanted and that's what pleases him. You see, we have been, in a essence, predestined to follow God and to be his children. But still, it is our choice. We can receive him or we can reject him. When he calls, we can come or we could go the other way. It still is our choice. But he's already predestined us to be his children. It says that God gave that grace to us freely in Christ, the one that he loves. See, it's not through our own power that we're able to achieve these things. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. And Jesus gives us the strength through his Holy Spirit in order to accomplish these things, in order to be workers for him. In Christ, we are set free by the blood that he has freely given to us fully from God. And with full wisdom and understanding, let us understand this purpose that Jesus has for us is that he is starting to create his last day army in order to fulfill his mission his mission as we stated last week jesus never got off track from what he was coming to this world for he came to seek and save that which was lost and today he is making preparations to finish it i was reading a book and it's kind of an interesting book because it's uh, called The Lucifer Diary and it's written from the perspective of Lucifer himself. And he starts to talk about the greatness and goodness of God and serving God in heaven, being able to stand next to the throne of God and he starts to describe what that throne looks like and every time the master speaks, the whole heavens moves. And colors come abroad, and, and it's just such a beautiful thing. He says that you're so attracted to him, you start to break out in, in worship and praise of songs to glorify the Lord of heaven and earth. And he, he writes and says, what a beautiful thing this is. He says, I don't understand why I'm so attracted to him. And it's not in a sense where a boy is attracted to a girl or vice versa. This is an attraction that your soul longs for, an attraction that you, you recognize that this is the source of life and love and hope and our destiny and all that we do. It's like that love that you have for an individual who you haven't seen for a while, but he means so much to you that when you do see him, you're just drawn to each other. Do you have somebody like that in your life? That you're just attracted to each other because you have the same types of goals. You have the same types of beliefs. You have the same types of backgrounds. I have a friend like that. And it's just like we, we just, we're one. You ever hear when somebody says, well, this is my brother from another mother. You kind of get and understand what I'm talking about. What attracts us to Christ is what he has done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. We have been set free by the blood of grace, and that is what God wanted. Now listen to this in verse 11 of chapter 1. It says, in Christ, we were chosen to be God's people. How many times have I said that already? At least three times, right? It sounds like God wants us to get the understanding that we are his what? His chosen people. He's done that in the past. He set up the people of Israel, the Jews and the Hebrews, in order to be what? His representatives here on earth. He wanted them to shine, to be a peculiar people, to be different from everybody else. You see, God says, don't be like everybody else, but be different. Be different in the way you work with people, in the way you talk to people, in the way you interact with people to be little lights of this world so that we can shine, so that Christ be lifted up and people be drawn unto him. He tells us that we've been chosen because from the very beginning, God has decided that this in keeping with his plan, he has chosen you. And he is the one who makes everything agree with what he decides and what he wants. Now, Paul's given us a little understanding of what God wants. You see... The scripture says that God or Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And if he goes to prepare a place for us, he will come again. Receive you unto himself. 
so that where he is, we can be also, right? We've heard that scripture in John many, many times. But think about it. Thoroughly think about it. When you go to prepare a place for somebody, you're taking time out to construct, to paint, to do things. It's like when you're about to receive a baby into your family. Countless trips to Walmart, to Home Depot, to Lowe's, or, or now Wayfair, right? You know, everybody's doing everything online. Receiving packages from UPS and taking them apart and putting things together. The part I hate. <laughs> and, and there you are preparing a place that is sufficient for that beautiful little baby to come home to. And you're making it nice and comfy. A place where mom can come and sit with baby and nurse at night. A place that is joyful. My son, uh, for their little nursery, he took a whole day to paint a wall, but he just didn't paint it. He, he painted trees and birds on the wall. He was so proud of that. He started taking pictures and posting it everywhere. Mom, Dad, you got to come see this. This is beautiful. The colors he chose were almost like Gladys's uh, blouse, just a very pretty color, subtle, peaceful. And he said, Dad, I chose this color so that if the baby's upset and she looks at this wall, she'll be able to calm down. You see, he put a lot of thought into that. I would have died. I said, well, get some red or orange. I don't know. You know, I'm a dude. I, I don't understand these things. I, I see primary colors. My wife sees fuchsia and all those other things that guys don't see. But when, when people start preparing and doing these things for you, it's an amazing thing. Because why you have been chosen already even before you were born to be part of this family. And this is what God wants us to understand. That we don't have to meet requirements in order to be a follower of Jesus. If he wants you to be a follower, he's already chosen you. All you have to do is come. Amen? When I first came into Florida... 1982, in July. Leaving my parents was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in life. But I came here because I was excited about serving the Lord. And when we got here that first week, I think we got here on a Thursday, um, on Sabbath, I told my, uh, my girlfriend, I says, let's hurry up and get dressed and go to church. My, my girlfriend says, I'm, you know, I'm really worn out by the ride. I mean, we just spent about five or six days on the road. We had a big old moving vans, and it was like, it was just a long, tiresome time. They just wanted to really rest at home. And I said, well, you know, what? I'm getting dressed. I'm going to church. And so nobody was going to church. So I, I asked her little cousin who was about eight or nine years old. I said, Stevie, can you, do you know the way to church? He says, yeah. Now remember back in Orlando in those days, 436 was mainly just a two-lane highway, and, and out here in, in the Four City area, there was nothing but orange groves everywhere. The Coca-Cola plant was there, and on every side around it was nothing but orange trees as far as the eyes could see, and these little two-lane highways that did this. And so I said, Stevie, are you sure you know how to get to church? He says, yeah. So we got in the car, we started driving. And I said, is this the right way? He said, uh, I think so. <laughs> So I started praying, and, and finally we made it to the little Four City Seventh-day Adventist Church right here in Bonnell. And um, did I tell you it was a Spanish church, meaning they spoke Spanish? Well, I got there, I didn't speak Spanish. I mean, I knew a little bit of Spanish, but I really didn't know too much. I knew when I was in trouble. But that's about it. Well, anyways, I, I went to the Spanish church because that's where Stevie only knew how to go to. And so we went there. And I remember walking into this church. And the people looked different than the people on the West Coast. You know? Uh, there was all different types of shapes and sizes. But there was an individual there. His name was Eladio Pauline. He was an elder of the church. And... He saw me kind of looking around, and he came to me, and he stuck his hand out, and he said, Bienvenido, joven. I like, let's de la Four City. And, you know, in other words, greetings, young man, to the church of Four City. Come on in. Have a seat. All this in Spanish. But he had a big smile. That's what he was speaking to me. Love. He was, I didn't hear Spanish. I heard love. 
And he said, toma asiento aquí, muchacho. And I sat down. He says, have a seat right here, son. And I sat down. And he started to speak to the class, which were a bunch of adults. I didn't understand a whole lot, but I kept looking at him. And he'd look at me periodically and smile. And his language wasn't Spanish. It was love. Now, he could have told me, hey, little kid, the young people are meeting in the gym across the, the ways over there. Or he could have said, the pastor's meeting over there with all the visitors. Go into that room. No, he says, have a seat here. In my class, I'll watch over you. And you know what, folks? I didn't understand Spanish, but I made a decision right there and then. I says, this is my church. This is the church I want to be a member of. And it was all because of that big smile. You see, when you're accepted for who you are and not what they want you to be, it's a wonderful feeling. Amen? When you're accepted... Just because you're a child of God, it's a wonderful feeling. And I'll never forget how we grew to know each other, me and Brother Pauline, and he just came to be, you know, to me, a, a very spiritual father-like figure, which I truly needed at that time in my life. Well, God wants you to understand that we are chosen by him, and it's part in keeping of his plan. He is the one who makes everything agree and decides with what he wants. We are the first people who he hoped in in Christ, and we are chosen so that we could bring praise and glory to God. So now it lies upon you to continue to carry that love and that message of hope. Amen? You know, when the bridegroom sees the bride for the first time, and he's full of joy, and he can't, he can't explain what he sees, so much beauty so much hope, so much love, it, it just comes out in tears. It's the same way Christ feels about you. You see, he's not looking at this run down, broken down, old, fat, and old man. He's looking at the potentials of what you can be, of what he's going to do through himself for you and for his purpose. Amen? He doesn't care about your PhD if you got it or not. He doesn't care if, if, if you have struggled in life or if you're in pain. The other day I was talking to people in wheelchairs, and I told them, you may not be able to, to move in places like everybody else. You may not even be able to speak, but you can think a prayer and bless somebody with it. And this one girl who's been sitting in a wheelchair for the past 10 years since she was a youngster, she sits up with joy, and she can't speak, but she starts to say, ah, ah. Huh? And her mother starts to cry. She says, I've never seen my daughter respond like this. She, you gave her hope. I said, no, I just wanted to affirm what God was already doing in her. When the people come from the outside and see this young girl. They see more than beauty. They see a smile. They see hope. And she can pray a prayer because she can still communicate in various ways. She may not speak, but she can get across her thoughts. Uh, my little tyke, she doesn't speak yet. But let me tell you, like all women, they let you know what they want. And you know exactly what she wants. Your, your wife looks at you, bro. You know what she wants. She give you that look. Okay, darling, I'm doing it right now. I'm going. Right? Communication comes in various ways. God is communicating to us today through his word. His word speaks for himself. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he wants a church to know that they have been chosen because he loves you. When your bride comes down the aisle, you've chosen her. You've spent time and money and invested in something to say, will you marry me? And hopefully she's going to say, let me think about it. Let me pray about it. <laughs> no, you want her to say, of course. Of course. God wants us to say, I do. Will you follow me? Yes, Lord, I will follow. When he called Peter, he says, come be followers of me. Then he said, well, wait a minute, Lord. You know, we got these boats here. We're going to have to sell them. And, you know, we're going to have to give. No, 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 no. And I got to go talk to my wife and see if she's all right with it. No, follow me. And immediately the scripture said, they followed him. Christ is calling his last day people here today to finish his work. And I just want you to know, you're it. He's chosen you. Be filled with joy, folks. 
Because he's coming. And we got a work to finish, don't we? And you know what? You don't have to be a theologian in order to share the gospel message with Christ. All you got to know is Jesus died for me and loves me and he's coming back. And I just want to share that with people like the man who couldn't read and went out anyways and shared the gospel message with what he heard and memorized and just shared the same message. Through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be able to accomplish much. Don't forget who you are. Satan tried to mess with Jesus. Are you sure you're the son of God? I mean, look at this. You're all by yourself. You smell. You haven't bathed. You're hungry. There's no servants around you feeding you grapes and and juice and nobody to keep you from the withering sun and the hot sun and the heat. You know, are you sure you're the son of God? Well, you know what? Let's, let's test this out. If you are, command these stones to be made to bread. Now, Jesus didn't have to, he didn't have to prove to anybody who he was. Do you know why? Because he heard his father's voice when he came straightway up out of the water. Lo, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. No doubt about it. The communication was there and clear for everybody to hear. Jesus knew who he was and what his purpose was on this earth to seek and save that which was lost. And now he's calling and depending on you. Won't you take that call today? Won't you receive his calling because you have been chosen? That's it, guys. Give up. Stop running. Turn around and embrace him. He'll keep running after you until you do. And pretty soon you'll be preaching from this pulpit instead of me. Glory, I'm looking for the day when I get to hear your voice from up here. I mean, she's already doing it through Chick-fil-A. It's just another way of expressing love, isn't it? I mean, these guys love you, Gloria. These guys that play in the band, they come here... To praise the Lord. They're amazing young men. I I just told them, i got to share this with you before we leave. I said, you know what joy it is to come and listen to their conversations when they're talking amongst themselves? They're not talking about, yeah, I was with this girl. Yeah, you know what they're talking about? They're still talking about Jesus and the love of praising and singing and performing for his honor and glory. I hope they can't hear me. I don't don't know where they're at, but they're probably eating more Chick-fil-A out there finishing it up. But... It, I told him, you know, it brings me joy to hear conversations, guys. You, you know what? Because when I was growing up with a bunch of guys your age, we were talking about who we wanted to make out with or, you know, what, all these foolish things that young men talk about. But here you guys are praising the Lord everywhere you go. What a blessing. And I know they're coming here to share their talents with you in praising Jesus. And at the same time, enjoying Chick-fil-A or the beautiful oasis that we have out there. Thank you for taking care of them and for loving them and sacrificing of yourself. That is why God has called us to do, if anything, to build each other up. We don't need a 1,000 people here. We just need to start with each other, right? Let us continue to pray for one another. Let us continue to be there for one another because you have been chosen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I can go on and on and on all day because I love talking about you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me despite all of my insecurities and my shortcomings. But Father, thank you for using each and every one of us for your honor and glory. In a small way, we contribute to the greater picture. And hopefully soon, Father, you'll be able to return and we'll be able to receive you and say, Lo, this is our God in whom we have waited. So, Father, continue to strengthen us and use us for your honor and glory as we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The Lord be with each and every one of you. Have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. I hope the day turns out to be a wonderful day. And uh, you guys stay strong in the Lord, and we'll see you next.